Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces from so many places. You've come a long way, I see. Uh, thank you for being here. Well, today we're talking uh, about how to get started in doing your pre-1850 research. Uh, there are lots of detailed things, such as what you're going to hear about uh, replacing uh, courthouse records and so on in the future, and I hope you take advantage of the excellent speaking uh, schedule that's coming up for you. Uh, just to get us oriented a little bit, uh, you want to keep in mind uh, that uh, America's first counties were originally called shires because it was part of England and all things were English over here. Uh, the first shires were established in Virginia in 1634. Uh, no other colonies uh, besides Virginia were sufficiently populated uh, to justify being broken into counties, uh, so we see very little. What you're looking at is one of the maps that comes from Animap, which is software that you can install on your computer. There are some uh, websites that take advantage of uh, their screenshots, uh, and you can find those uh, out there in a number of places. Uh, Animap allows you to pop into a particular year, uh, any year of interest to you, uh, and see what the borders looked like for a state or a county uh, at the time that your ancestor lived. Uh, and that's very important because the jurisdiction for finding the documents you're looking for changes with those boundaries. Sometimes records generated in one colony were forwarded on to another state or territory as its uh, government got organized. Sometimes it wasn't. Uh, so it's a, it's a good thing for you to know exactly where you were at any given point in time. As you can see, uh, originally, uh, Britain had 20 colonies. We don't think of the 20 colonies of Great Britain. We just think of the 13 that revolted and got away with it. Uh, the rest of them were up in Canada uh, and uh, remained Canadian and loyal to the King and Queen of England uh, to this day. Uh, so in the original 13 that we talk about when doing US research, uh, we didn't have the, the northern part uh, of Maine and a number of other places that we think of as being U.S. We also stopped our population here with the Carolinas. Uh, this was a very well populated Indian territory down here with five Indian nations uh, that uh, unfortunately sided with the British in some of the early uh, Indian wars and in the French and Indian War. Uh, and they lost their territory because they backed the losing side. Uh, at which point uh, we began to populate in the lands that they used to uh, hold down so very well. So this is 1776. Uh, here's the, the US uh, in 1810. Uh, we had had a, a, a boundary here at the Mississippi River and then we had all those wild machinations with Spain and France passing the Louisiana territory as we know it back and forth by secret treaty several times uh, to foil the, uh, the Brits and us. Uh, and eventually in 1803, as you know, the, uh, Napoleon had, uh, had sold to us the Louisiana territory in order to uh, fund his uh, campaign to take uh, the island uh, of England, uh, and uh, then as soon as he was done, he was planning to come back and retake the, the Louisiana territory that he just sold us, uh, because he would then have all the navies of England to back him. <laughs> he would have controlled them all. So it used to be that uh, the U.S. stopped here at the Mississippi. Uh, for a very long time, that was the case. And what we think of as France, uh, for the middle third was actually Spain for a couple hundred years. Ooh, where are the records going to be? Are they going to be in American repositories, Spanish or French repositories? Oh my, something new to think about. And it really does matter depending on when you're doing that search. 
Uh, so here we are in 1810, uh, and you'll notice that Mississippi territory seems to include Alabama, where a lot of my folks were. Uh, we have uh, Indiana Territory, Illinois Territory, Michigan Territory, and Louisiana. Okay, uh, Orleans Territory down here. If you have somebody in 1810 who lived in Louisiana or was married or died in Louisiana, it might have been in North Dakota. <laughs> so you do need to kind of bear that in mind. Where were they at the time that my ancestors lived? Here we are 10 years later in 1810, uh, and now Louisiana is Missouri. Your ancestors haven't moved, they're still in North Dakota. <laughs> Michigan has uh, moved out and over and taken up quite a bit of other places, and we have to kind of keep track of where we are. The solid colored states are states that are no longer territories. And you notice that uh, we've already had our, our War of 1812 and we've managed to win the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, so all of this area is now ours. But this is still Spain. Okay, so who are our people and where are they? A year later, uh, we no longer have Missouri. Missouri is a state, but Missouri Territory is now unorganized territory, mostly controlled by various uh, Native American tribes. Uh, Arkansas uh, is still Arkansas, not Oklahoma, and not uh, uh, various Indian tribe uh, lands. Uh, 1838, now this is Iowa, up into Canada. Do you have some Iowa farmers? Hmm. Where are they really? Here we are in 1845. Iowa Territory is populated more, but as you can see, we're making progress on uh, taking Texas and uh, annexing them. Uh, and you'll notice that Texas extends kind of up into the belly button of the country. Hmm. So you need to keep track of that also. And we have Florida no longer Spain, it's part of the U.S. And we had two Floridas. Uh, here's 1846, uh, which was the seminal year. This is when Polk, uh, uh, President Polk uh, succeeded in his four major um, uh, initiatives to take the Oregon country, which was jointly administered country with uh, England, uh, that we had uh, uh, managed to inherit from Russia, which formerly uh, administered this whole area. Uh, and we are moving farther and farther to the west in the great effort to take San Francisco Bay, which we desperately needed for the trade with China uh, and with uh, the Hawaiian Islands, then known as the Sandwich Islands. So we are, we are going into the Mexican-American War in 1846 uh, and we're going to change all the boundaries after that. Uh, this becomes Oregon Territory, and you'll notice that Oregon is also Idaho, etc. I'm sure you're getting the general idea here that you need to kind of keep track of what it was at the time that your ancestors were there. If you're having trouble finding them in those pre-1850 uh, times, it's because they were there, they just didn't call it there. <laughs> uh, here's 1849 and what was happening then? The gold rush. Uh, everybody who is patriotic and has an eye for business and uh, an idealistic notion of what they can accomplish and send home again uh, is pouring across uh, the plains if they're going the slow way or they're going by ship uh, through Tehuantepec uh, and uh, other places where they can catch malaria and die on the way so you'll lose them. Uh, some are going around Cape Horn uh, to come on up and then taking steamers that have been set up on this side. It's a very exciting time of life. So here we are in our pre-1850 era, and I hope that that little quickie will get you oriented a bit. 
Uh, this gives us a sense of uh, where we were from uh, 1790 on, after we had won the American Revolution uh, and set up our Constitution and had a government that was starting to function and actually had some documents. Uh, before that, we have the, the 1600s up to 1790 is a different beast altogether. Uh, so the, the, the different types of documents that we look at change with those major watershed moments in our history. Uh, here's 1850, and you'll notice that Utah is clear over here in the belly button of the nation. Uh, and uh, Texas is no longer up there. This is all New Mexico. This is all Utah clear over to the California boundary and so on. I'm going to leave our tour uh, of the states uh, at this point and uh, invite you to go see Anamap whenever you get an opportunity. It's uh, well worth having whenever you're doing census work. So in the normal course of things, uh, the first st stop for many genealogists is to look at census records uh, because we can find pretty much whole family groups all at once and have uh, some degree of confidence that we're actually putting the right people together with the right set of parents. So we do our census searches um, back to 1850 and we're very happy and confident because the head of household uh, is listed along with members of the, the household. And in most of those, we see the relationship between the head of household and the other people living there. So it actually says wife or daughter-in-law or mother-in-law or, or something useful uh, to tell us what that relationship is. But that started, that every name business, started in 1850. So 1850 is that cutoff point where we start going, I'm not really sure now, because the federal censuses that went from 1790 uh, until 1840, every 10 years, just gave us the head of household uh, and little tick marks that said, oh, there's a female who's under the age of five, and there's a male who's between 30 and 40, and a bunch of others, and it's, uh, who are these people, and I have no idea. Besides which, the society at the time was very fond of taking in boarders, uh, and uh, there were many lodgers who were uh, workmen, who were laborers on farms and the like, uh, and we also have separate listings uh, for people who were slaves during that era, and we can make some progress uh, by using those. Uh, so censuses, uh, our watershed is 1850, and when we go back to 1840, uh, we start getting intimidated and a lot of people just quit. Don't do that. <laughs> There's so much stuff out there. And I hope by the end of today that I will convince you that there is something you haven't found yet that is really accessible and you don't have to go back to Iowa or Florida and drive all the way across country to a courthouse in order to find it. A lot of it is now online. A lot of it isn't, but a lot of it is online. So I'd like to invite you to uh, be a lazy bum, which I am very fond of being as a genealogist, by taking advantage of a wonderful uh, bit of software that's a, uh, it's actually a website that's uh, available to you. If you are using Family Search and you have your, uh, your pedigree on there, and if you don't, you can upload it and uh, get on right away, it's free. Um, if you go to Family Search and have your pedigree uh, in that website's uh, uh, family tree, you can take advantage of a number of certified affiliates to Family Search. These are groups that are um, commercial vendors. Uh, they, many of them are free. Uh, some of them are available for a relatively small amount of money. Uh, but they, they all use Family Search uh, data by your permission. Uh, it does not store your information, your username and password. Anytime you go on to one of these affiliates, you will sign on uh, using your Family Search 
username and password. Now one of the places that you can take advantage of is actually my fave when it comes to census work. You go to treeseek.com. TreeSeq uh, is known primarily for the beautiful charts that it does. Uh, but you can um, go to familysearch.org, click this button, log in now to create your chart, and this will take you to sign in on Family Search. This allows this website to access your data that you personally have put on and that others have built up with you uh, and, uh, and uh, start charting that. So if you go on the, on the next window, go down here to this corner, and you're going to choose Source Tracker. Oh, a happy place. You're going to want to go to Source Tracker and be lazy forevermore. So what Source Tracker does is it uh, puts the, the names of the people in your, uh, your pedigree down one side, and then it puts the censuses across the top. So starting here, we have 1790, 1800, 1810, and so on, up to 1940, which as you know is the, the latest one that we can currently get at. Uh, and what it does is next to each name, uh, and it'll show birth and death so you can orient yourself readily, uh, it shows what you have already found in censuses and attached to your person as documentation for somebody in family search. So here, uh, if we look at uh, Arthur Gaston Miller, for example, uh, it shows that his lifespan runs from the 1890 census up through the 1930 census. It figured that out all by itself by looking at your family search uh, data, so you know that you only have five censuses that you need to look at for that person. Uh, the check mark means uh, I've already been there, I've already collected up the census image uh, and attached that uh, to Arthur Gaston Miller in Family Search. Uh, so it you know went into my source box and it's you know it's one of the official sources uh, for documenting this person. But here we see a magnifying glass, which means that I have not yet searched for the census for 1890 for Arthur Gaston. Uh, well, some, but you know, mostly not. Um, uh, or for Bessie May, um, my grandma on the other side. Uh, so we can go back and see, and she lived longer than Arthur did. Uh, so we're going to have one extra for her. And then over here it has a column that shows how many sources, whether it's census or not, it shows how many sources you have for that individual that you've attached in Family Search. So if you see somebody that has zero, mm -mm -mm -mm, <laughs> you know that you went to bed instead of attaching that and doing your homework. <laughs> So go back, fess up, and document where you got this information. Uh, so let's go down and uh, look at an example of someone who falls in our pre-1850 category. Here's Isaac Stubbs, uh, who was born in 1817, uh, and he died in uh, 1882. It shows his lifespan here. So we go from uh, the 1820 to the 1880 censuses, right? We're all together. As soon as I lose you, let me know. Um, and I've only attached two of those censuses for 1850 and 1860. Uh, so I would certainly want to go pick up uh, this low-hanging fruit easy stuff that's on this side of 1850. Uh, and then go back and see what I can find in those earlier censuses. But no, say you in your heart of hearts, that's too hard. How could I ever do that? Well, there is yet another tool. Mm -hmm. It's up here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we like to use our brains. Uh, and I'm going to show you that it's not as painful as it may seem. So, uh, when you click on uh, that magnifying glass, uh, it will take you <clears throat> filling in everything 
in one click. You don't have to type it in and put all those typos in. And you don't have to go back and forth and keep looking it up. You just click the magnifying glass. And it comes back and it says, oh, look, here are a whole bunch of places where you can find your person in a census. Here's, <coughs> pardon me, here's the, the transcription of it. And here is the digital image where you can go look at it. Now, of course, some of them will not have a digital image available, in which case there won't be a little camera icon, but you are well familiar with that, I'm sure. So as we look at uh, the Isaac Stubbs here, and we look at the locations, uh, and compare that to where we know Isaac was, we find that there are only two possible matches that were in Ohio, where the family was living, when we last knew them. So in 1850 and 1860, the family is in Ohio, so we kind of want to start there. Uh, this is the earliest known residence for Isaac uh, from our, our census, so let's go check out those two. So um, uh, let me also mention that we're looking at censuses, but there's another tab on the source tracker. This is the US Census tab where we're gonna spend our time today. But there's also a vital events tab where you can look for marriage records, birth merit, uh, and, and death records also on this same place. And you're all going, why haven't I been using this? Yes, you have been working too hard. Uh, and uh, go get a donut and come back. <laughs> okay, so. We're looking at uh, the two possibilities for Isaac in 1840. And this is the census uh, of what the family looked like in 1850, where we had every name. So I'm sorry, this isn't a, a great image, but uh, we have Isaac Stubbs, and he's 39. His wife, Charlotte's uh, 39 also. Uh, and they have several children. Uh, Susanna is age 11, William 9, Esther 7, Rosanna 4, Lindley 2, and little baby Elizabeth. So, you are all brilliant mathematicians. Okay, so here we go. It's on upstairs, right? We're going to do the brain bit. So, if we're going to go 10 years earlier, how old is Isaac Stubbs? Oh, you're so smart. Okay, how about Susanna? How about William? Esther? Rosanna? <laughs> what about Elizabeth? They're not going to show up, right? They're still up there in the cloud looking down saying, oh, that's my family to be, but they're not going to be here yet. Yes? Yes, this is just, uh, it, it, uh, source tracker only uh, ties into uh, the U.S. federal census. Thank you. Okay, so you know then that when we go to the 1840 census on the other side of the Great Divide, what are we looking for? We're looking for Isaac and a woman who are going to fall in the 20-something bracket, right? Uh, and one little girl uh, who is going to be very young, right? She's going to be the under 10 or under 5 category, whatever it's saying on there. And nobody else uh, should be there. Okay, so that's what we're looking for, and we only have to look at two of them. Do you think we can cope? <laughs> okay, here we go. Other side. Ugh. All right, so here is Anne Isaac Stubbs in the 1840 U.S. Federal Census uh, in Butler County, Ohio. Well, Isaac's father died in Butler, Ohio, so that, you know, encourages us that it's come up in a place that's related to the family in some way. Uh, and then when we look at Isaac down here, we see all these little idiot tick marks that tell us zip. Uh, in the normal course of things. But if you look up at the top, uh, it has males and females, and we're going to have slaves who are males and females. Uh, and in the, in the males category, 
up here it says we have somebody who's a teenager and we have a 20 something male okay uh, and then we have a female under five well that's our 11 year old right could be could be we also have a female who's between 10 and 15 no doubt terrorizing Facebook uh, and uh, we have a female in, in her 20s. Uh, so there are some extra bodies in here, but we do have the right ones for what we need to be there, okay? So we could have uh, a younger brother, we could have a nephew, which is very common, um, that could be in that household. Uh, and we can uh, see, oh, maybe we have somebody who is uh, a, a household servant. We have many possibilities, but we have not eliminated this one as a possibility because we have the ones that we need uh, in 1840 in Butler, which is a known relationship to the family. All right, let's go look at that other one. There are only two, but let's go look at the other one. Now here's an Isaac Stubbs, and he's living next to Zimri. Well, we do have Zimris in other generations. It was a very common name in the South, and a lot of them ended up in Ohio with, with a lot of Zimris too. And as we look at this, we're going a male, 15 to 20, but uh, our guy should have been in his 20s. He's not there. Here's another one who's uh, 50 to 60. Hmm, that's not him. We don't have mom. Uh, th this is not the right constellation, right? It's just not the right mix of, uh, of gender and age. So we're going to eliminate this one. Well, there were only two. So let's guess. You know, we don't have proof yet, but we have some pretty good circumstantial evidence to say Butler County, Ohio, still there in the 40s. Let's go search for them in the 40s in the county. And then we'll switch over from census records to county records to go find them in more detail. Okay, so that's the basic process of looking at censuses before 1850. Did I lose anybody yet? Okay, I'm gonna work harder then. Okay, here we go. So the next thing that we want to do is start looking at town and county searches. We've been looking at censuses at the federal level. Now we're gonna look at town and county. Town and county is absolutely the place you want to go during the colonial era. So this is your 1600s and 1700s up and uh, through the revolution uh, until we get to our 1790 uh, first census. So in order to understand this, you really need to understand uh, the, uh, the social structure that existed during colonial days because it's different from what it was after our country got going and we established the jurisdictions that we're more familiar with. So let me just do a, a quick, quick summary, which breaks my heart, but let me give you a quick, quick summary uh, of what was going on uh, during those two centuries. Uh, this is the era of the merchant kings. This is a time when the major corporations of the day were in fact more powerful than the monarchies of the world. Uh, in the 17th century, there were uh, a lot of monetary problems, a lot of economic stress uh, that was largely brought about because Spain was bringing back all this gold and silver from the New World. Uh, and that was uh, throwing all the markets into total disarray of you know what's worth what anymore, uh, and that led to the notion of gosh you know anybody who gets the goods could actually be rich instead of just somebody who's in a noble line, so society began to realign itself and see that there were possibilities besides your bloodline. So during an era of emerging industrialism where we're going to manufacture things and we're going to go trading around the world, the merchant kings emerged as the new aristocracy. They are the ones that were the most wealthy and they are the ones who pushed trade and commerce. They were given extraordinary powers. Those who were the heads of these monopolies 
uh, had the power of life and death. They had the right to their own armies and their own navies. And they functioned very much independently. They had charters from the king, but they were only marginally being accountable and only marginally, marginally obeying. Uh, so they were very powerful entities. Uh, if you've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, whichever version it was, where um, they're, they're getting the heart in the little box. Are any of you Pirates of the Caribbean movie watchers? I'm just talking nonsense anyway, so never mind. Um, there are scenes in there where you see the power of uh, these, um, these things. So during this era of the Merchant Kings, which is 1600s primarily, uh, but it oozes out on either side, the American immigrants were largely young radicals. They were, yes, uh, some of them were radicalized over religion, but they were very, um, let's look at a different form of society. We can invent whatever we want and we can go around the world and be rich and we don't have to be under the thumbs that we have always been. Let's be creative, let's think of other ways, let's try out what actually works for us this was pretty radical thinking in a very traditional world. Uh, so in order to uh, move to the new world, uh, you're going to have people who are willing to take on things that are very much just, it's not just a new neighborhood. They're going to try a whole new way of living, a new way of governing themselves. So the, uh, the main monopolies that uh, you may recognize are like the Dutch East India Company and West India Company, uh, which was responsible for most of the African slave trade. Uh, and they were, they were, the West Indies is, you know, in the Caribbean. Um, and in, in fact, uh, only 4% of, of uh, slaves brought from Africa uh, were brought to America. The vast majority of them uh, were taken to the Caribbean, uh, and the, the, the West Indies uh, was the place for that. They were um, marketed from, uh, from the Caribbean islands uh, into South America, which had a huge number of, uh, of, of slaves from Africa working there. Uh, so this was a very powerful, powerful company. The English East India, uh, company was the one that was taking advantage of all the wars that were uh, going on. They had found a place where they could get uh, saltpeter, uh, which is used in making explosives and uh, as you know there were lots of wars going on and they were always going to make money. Uh, <clears throat> they also got involved in uh, silk and uh, cotton textiles and so on. The Russian American uh, company with uh, uh, all the romantic tales of Alexander Baranov um, which are always fun to read. Uh, they were after sea otter fur, uh, and they had uh, Alaska and uh, down the west coast, and uh, Fort Ross out here on, on, the, on the coast was theirs. Uh, the Hudson Bay Company uh, plays a very important role in our history. Uh, they're up in Canada, uh, uh, for the most part, uh, and they were going after the beaver fur uh, until our people uh, started heading west, uh, and also wanting to trap the very lucrative uh, uh, fur trade. Uh, so they decided that the only way to keep the Americans out was to create a fur desert to kill off uh, the, the females that they had otherwise protected so that there would be more the next season. Uh, they, they killed off as many as they could so that there just wouldn't be anything for the Americans to come and get. Uh, so we ended up having the mountain men uh, that worked for Hudson's Bay Company coming south and spreading out all over uh, the United States and becoming quite a bother here in California uh, doing their mountain men thing. And there are great stories uh, with that. Uh, the, the other was the British South African uh, Company, which I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Cecil Rhodes uh, uh, mining over in Africa. 
Uh, so it, here are these very powerful companies, and they go other places. They are completely independent. They make a lot of money, and they do what they want. And a person who has no interesting background, someone who has no chance of making it uh, in Europe, can go out there and become one of the most powerful people in the world. There are a lot of people who are attracted to that, who are more than willing to go. They would form companies just like these great monopolies. One of the earliest that uh, we are very fond of talking about was a company that sailed across on the Mayflower. Now, in elementary school, we think of the big tall hats and the, the white uh, bib-like collars and so on, and that they had come over because of religious persecution. Absolutely, they did. But they also came because they were very good businessmen and they wanted to create business. The 102 passengers on the Mayflower had a company contract that they called the Mayflower Compact. Here is a, a, a written version of this, uh, and before we uh, leave the written version and go to a, an easier to read transcript, let me just point out something. This little squiggle up here, I don't know, if, can you see that? Okay, uh, it's a Y with an E up in the air, uh, which you would say ye, right? That's a, like ye old tavern. Well, that's not a Y. It's a TH. It's by the grace of God. But our misreading this Y with the superscript E has generated all the Yees that you all believe in that were not part of the language. So just so you know, a Y is a TH. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, here is uh, the contract that the 102 passengers of the Mayflower signed. Uh, in the name of God, amen, we whose names are underwritten, what ho, a list of names, first of all, for all of these company contracts, you're going to get a list of everybody who went that was joined together, okay? Loyal subjects of the king, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of the king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Okay, so here's a list of names of people who are going for a specific purpose to a specific place, okay? And we are going to covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic, what ho. We are going to create our own new government for our better ordering, preservation, and furtherance of the ends of making a colony in Virginia. And by virtue hereof, we will enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof, uh, we subscribe our names at Cape Cod on the 11th of November in the reign of our King James. Okay. So we are going to create a government. We're going to create offices. We're going to create our own laws. We're not going over saying we're going to go be English subjects according to English laws and English ways of doing things. We're going to go make up our own and we're going to sign it, and here are the people who signed it, okay? So uh, I'm sure a number of you have a Mayflower relative someplace, how many of you do, that you know, okay? Uh, if you do, that's fun. Uh, there are millions of people in the U.S. today who are related in some manner to the Mayflower. Uh, and for sake of your grandchildren doing their fourth grade and third grade uh, pedigree chart things, uh, just for fun, I just wanted to show you a website called relativefinder.org. Relativefinder.org. This is another one of those FamilySearch affiliates. 
where uh, you go to relativefinder.org and then it asks you to sign in with your family search username and password but you go to family uh, relative finder first relativefinder.org and then it will ask you for your family search username and password and then it will come back and allow you to see how you are related in family search so this depends on what you and others have already put into family search uh, and you know if you don't have that particular branch that goes from here to there yet uh, it's not going to show that but if it's already in it's going to show you um, what your relationship is to um, uh, authors and poets, Catholic saints and popes, composers, signers of the Constitution, Declaration, various entertainers, European royalty, famous Americans, various uh, Mormon people, uh, people who came on the Mayflower. And if you're interested in that, you just put a little check mark there in front of Mayflower. I mean, you can check the whole thing if you want. Um, movie stars, uh, science and technology, which I personally find very interesting. It has explorers, U.S. presidents, and so on. So if you're interested in finding out if you're related to any of these people, these people have been put into groups, uh, and uh, it just, on family search, if there's a link that's already been established on the pedigree that goes from here to there, it'll show you who you're related to in each of those groups. Uh, and exactly what the relationship is, and if it's one of these up and down, you know, cousin things, uh, it'll show you who the common ancestor is between you. Uh, so I, I have four of them. Uh, none of them are direct line, but my daughter has a couple of direct line people that would have come off my husband's line. Uh, so it's fun to see that. So this is my daughter's, and uh, her 10th great-grandfather is Edward Fuller, who was one of the signers of the Mayflower Compact. Uh, and you can uh, pop over here and hit View, uh, and it will show you, this is uh, longer than uh, would scroll easily to, to show you, but it shows you, here's Edward Fuller, and it shows uh, my daughter's down here, and uh, living people, and it, it shows, okay, this went through the father's line, this came through the mother's line, and so it shows you which side uh, you went up in order to get there, uh, uh, in, in order to get to a Mayflower person. And it really is just two clicks and you're there. So just for fun, uh, if you just want to see if you happen to be related, uh, there we are. Now, diversion, sorry, back to work here. Okay, so the people who came over on the Mayflower established, whoops, established, eh, going the wrong way. Eh, there, established uh, their own laws that would make sense in a wilderness with the, the kinds of people that they had available to them, with the types of things that they needed to do. And they didn't need to do a lot of the things that you needed to do if you lived in London of the day. You know, what they needed was very different. And so they set up laws and uh, government offices that would make sense there. Now, this is a company, and everybody has a job. So you are going to be the carpenter. You are going to be uh, the barrel maker. You are going to work in leather. Uh, you are going to repair rifles. Everybody has a job, and that's specified. And once a year, you renew it. And if you're a slacker or just don't have any talent in that particular area, you're voted out of office and you must find something else to do to remain part of the company. Or some new young stud is going to replace you, just like they do today. Uh, so it's all specified from the earliest ships bringing over companies of settlers, companies who are here to make a profit everybody had to do something useful and that is specified you can go read their company contracts you can go read their laws and you can go find out exactly how it all worked where they uh, set up a settlement each settlement had its own set of laws and each one of them would be governed eventually by a governor of a colony once they had enough people there to justify calling it a colony. Before that, it was just the company working on its own. 
So eventually, by 1660, so we're you know half a century into a settlement, uh, we find that community life is centered around a church. There is a meeting house with a minister. Uh, houses are grouped around the church. Uh, communities where a home would be too far away from an existing church to get there on Sunday would either take that minister with them and move on out to a, a better neighborhood, uh, or uh, they would uh, uh, go settle it and then send off for a minister from England. Uh, there were seminary schools going crazy in England. We couldn't get enough ministers. Now in England, who runs social welfare and uh, tax collecting in this era? Church. It's the church. So if you are an Englishman, you just kind of assume, well, you know, the church is going to do the same thing. We'll, we'll do that here too. Uh, so you had to have a minister who was going to be kind of the mayor. And he was going to run the local government. He was going to be the tax collector and the head of the welfare system and all that sort of thing. Uh, and in order to set up a, a, a settlement, a town, you had to have a minister, and you had to build the church and his dwelling before you could build your own. Was this all Church of England? Uh, uh, yes, yes, all Church of England. Yes, absolutely. Uh, as you know, like uh, Maryland was, uh, not, but in these early days, we're looking at Church of England. Uh, at Church of England ruled uh, pretty much everything. Uh, so there are very specific um, social structures that just came over because, well, hey, that's what we do, that works, so let's do that here. But each town is separately choosing to do this, and they set it up. Now, in New England, the vast majority did pretty much the same thing, and this was the way it worked. Uh, so that system is what you're going to find in New England. Now, New England is where we have most of the settling going on. They didn't move south or west for quite some time, um, lar largely because of the Native American hostilities and the many Indian wars that were going on and the innumerable massacres and so on until the Pequot War. At any rate, uh, a freeman was somebody who owned some land and was of age. Uh, the freemen would be, okay, we're members of the company and we all have a vote. Uh, in what we're going to do, and they would make regulations at a town meeting uh, for both civil and religious affairs. So if you don't like the way that your minister preaches, you fire him, and you send off for another one from England. Or you try to, um, you know, send, send the headhunters out and see if you can get the one from the next village over because you like the way he talks better. And they did that. They did that all the time. But the thing is that we need kind of one of each. You know, we, we need a barrel maker. We need a, 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 a rifle repairman. Uh, and so you can't leave our town, our, our company, until you find a replacement for yourself. So in order to move somewhere else to go out west, you had to advertise or you had to personally go and find somebody who would come and take your place. Okay? And all of that is recorded in the company records, which are town records. Each town was its own company. Ah, okay. Different way of looking at things, but now you're going to understand. So the people who are making up these regulations in town meetings, you know, they've got a life to live. They're not going to do that 24 hours a, a, a day. So we're going to meet quarterly and bring up whatever problems and, you know, have our court and uh, try to do problem solving. Uh, every three months we'll get together and we'll do that. So we're going to have a general court where we bring everybody together and the general court will meet quarterly. So our meetings are going to be called quarter sessions. Okay? So when you go to look things up, you're going to look up all of these details about who got married, who had children, who wanted to move, who replaced them, what their jobs are, how well they're doing at that. That's all in the town records that have 
the quarter sessions of what the Freeman said every three months when they had their meeting. Okay? This is where the records are found, and the records are so detailed and so fabulous. If you haven't been there before, it's just going to blow you away. Uh, so by 1677, the general court, which is, you know, everybody getting together and agreeing on stuff, ordered that each town of 50 families or more had to have a school. And if the school, you know, if you couldn't afford to pay uh, the teacher, uh, then it should come from community funds. And of course, everybody's along the seaboard there. And it will come from the profits uh, that are being uh, turned in in part through the customs house along the coast uh, and through uh, fees that are put on uh, fishing uh, in Cape Cod. So there will be some kind of a tax that's happening that is decided on locally. Okay? So this is, this is the way that things worked and it's all very detailed. Now they also had a kept track of what they called removals, which is somebody who wants to move out place. Those are called removals. So you're going to look for removal records. So what we're going to do when we're looking at uh, the era before the American Revolution, uh, we're going to look at a social structure that's like this. So from the 1600s and 1700s until we become a country, we're looking at company records that are stored at the town level because each town is its own separate company. Okay? So town records is where we go uh, to get everything that we need for those two centuries. And in the town records, we will find church records, we will find voter registration, we will have records of those who are tithable, that is taxable, they're of age and uh, you know, they're you know, males 16, 18, or 21, depending on where you lived and so on. Local taxes, uh, so you know, we need a tax to support the school uh, and we're doing pretty well from Cape Cod fishing, so we'll take most of it out of that, but you still have to pay two and a half cents a head. Uh, and the general court records, general court records is just everybody in town getting together and discussing it, and here's the answer, okay? And then there's some people who are more organizationally uh, oriented and who can read and write better than others who keep the records, and they become the administrators of the court. But this is, this is all a company running a company town. Okay, so where do we get town records? We go to AmericanAncestors.org, which is a fantastic website. If you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this is one of the, the four or five uh, major websites uh, that are subscription sites uh, that uh, are paid for by the church, uh, making it free to anybody who's a member. Uh, so if you, if you are LDS and you have not yet signed up, this is one of the freebies that you get. So just go to Family Search, drop down to the App Store at the very bottom, uh, and there'll be a place for you to link your Family Search uh, account uh, to Ancestry.com, American Ancestors, Genianet, uh, find my past and my heritage. We also subscribe here at the Central Library. You need to go to the second floor desk and have the librarian uh, log you on, but just here at Central Library. It is a wonderful website. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, this is available to you at all the family history centers uh, for you to use for free. Uh, and uh, we, we invite everybody to, uh, to come and make use of that. So this is the home page of AmericanAncestors.org, which is going to be your main source of information, uh, your main happy place uh, for the 1600s, 1700s. Uh, and right down here, it says New England Town Guides. Well, most everybody was in New England, so go there. They focus on uh, documents from New England, but also documents uh, on those who uh, who removed, who moved from New England to the next town over and the next town over. Uh, so there are fewer documents the farther you get away from uh, New England, 
Uh, most of them are going to be New England, but that's where most everybody was. Yes? Are removals ever uh, because they dislike the person or their family? to get them out of the town? Oh, yes, oh, yes. We had official busybodies. We did, and they were hired, they were paid. There were people in every town whose job it was uh, to kind of, you know, keep track of everybody, see what they're doing. And if somebody comes into town who's new and they don't recognize them, they go and say, well, who are you? Where have you come from? What are you doing? Where are you staying? Who's feeding you? And, uh, you know, uh, do you, are, you don't think you They are, be, because this is a company town and they have agreed by their company contract uh, to have retirement plans and welfare and, and medical support in here and get that for free. I don't care if your village was wiped out and there's nobody left but you and your three kids. You don't have a right to be here. So we will warn you out. Warnings out are part of what you'll find in the general court records. Warnings out just put you on notice. You've got two weeks to either make yourself a part of our company and be useful, uh, or you gotta move on, because we are not gonna be responsible for you. Uh, and if somebody takes them in uh, and is you know, a kind, good person, they get hassled for it, uh, unless uh, you know, that you, they can be made productive members of the company in the company town. Uh, so people who didn't like this or who didn't like uh, their minister in particular, uh, a lot of the town records uh, say that the reasons for somebody's removal, where you know, they are choosing to go is, you know, me and my buzz aren't going to put up with this no more. We are out of here. You go find yourself another rifle. Uh, and uh, you know, we're going over the hill. Uh, and they, there are many of those entries say it's because they can't stand their minister. Uh, and, and that really, that was one of the most common things. Or they were just kind of disagreeable people in the first place. You know, in, in truth, a lot of the people that came over were, you know, not very likable. You know, I mean, think mountain men, you know, they're very much the, the, the solo, a little bit hostile, not, not really good with social graces types. Uh, and uh, so many of them, uh, just didn't get along and they just kept moving west. Uh, but you'll find them listed in removals. Uh, and if somebody was enough of a pain that everybody was, you know, calm, isolating manner, they said, you know, we're going. Uh, so uh, they have the, the, the town busybody whose job is to hassle people. Uh, and to find out everything about them, where are they coming from, and why, you know, why are they here, uh, and who's going to stay with them. And that, all of that information is recorded in the town records. So everybody who comes through town, there, there's this little busybody write-up. It's great. I mean, you're just going to love it when you get into these records. It's a riot to read this stuff. Yes, sir. How were the towns organized geographically? What, was their, what were their boundaries? Were they townships, or did they go beyond? Oh, that's, that's later. You know, they, they become townships. You know, when, we, when there are enough of them that uh, there's enough of a population to have a colony that has enough population that we will officially break it and put a boundary here. Otherwise, it's just, you know, we arrived on the ship, this looks pretty good, you know, and we're gonna use this land and uh, nobody killed us when we went across the creek, so we'll use that too. Um, it, you know, it, it's basically, you know, like that in the beginning. Uh, but once there's an, uh, enough of a population, then the general court uh, and uh, the administration of the colony uh, will say, yes, you may set up another settlement. Um, for a while, because of the, uh, the massacres that were going on for a hundred years, I mean, uh, you go out there in the wilderness and you really were scalped and, and killed. I mean, it really was a very hostile environment. You could not start a new town unless you had 50 or 60 families that signed up. And you had to get approval from the colonial government to go set up a town someplace because you would be wiped out. Uh, and then somebody would have to you know, go send uh, the colonial militia out. And they didn't want to have to deal with that unless you know, they had agreed to it. 
so it, the, the township boundaries and that sort of thing is a later development. Uh, so in the, the middle 1700s, you're going to see more of that happening, uh, but it, it's more there than, than early on. There were other hands over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, all the supplies used to men. What happened with, I can't say the woman was a bit dirty. <laughs> it worked the same, uh, and they were, uh, they were uh, often in the mornings out. Uh, there were a lot of widows. There were, there were so many, um, uh, so many massacres. Uh, there really were a, a lot of widows that would come through. Uh, and uh, you know, if you wanted to leave, you wanted to leave, but you needed to find somebody who would, you know, if, if you're in a little fort or a semi-fortified town and there's an Indian attack, somebody still has to uh, man the wall in that location. So you have to find somebody that's trained that can hold down that part of it. Uh, the women had, uh, had jobs. Uh, I mean, aside from building up the, the population, a lot of them were washerwomen and made soap and made cheese. Cheese making was very big. Uh, everybody's living along the coast pretty much, and uh, they're salting fish. Uh, they're they're uh, making tar. Uh, they're they're uh, scooping up salt and purifying that, and uh, that was a major export item and so on. Uh, so people had their jobs. Another question. Oh yeah, all the witch trials are part of the records. Yes, you'll definitely find that in the town records for sure, yeah. Okay, I must dash along as usual. You, you all know me that know me. <sighs> okay, so here we are on uh, ancest uh, American Ancestors. Uh, and when you pop in, you can uh, use the left-hand sidebar filters uh, to filter uh, where you want to go. Uh, by the, the time frame uh, or by different categories. So if you are looking for vital records, where would you go? If you're looking for cemetery or land records or probate, and you do definitely, you're gonna spend a lot of time in probate records, but they're here online. So it's, you know, it's not a, a horror to go get them. Uh, all the censuses, voter lists, uh, the town records, various diaries and journals and whatnot. Uh, these are all here, and you can look specifically for the kind of record that you want uh, by using one of these filters. Uh, what you get over here is uh, the, the full list of, of the databases. Uh, so let me just mention a couple of them. Here's Albany County, uh, first settlers of uh, from 1630 to 1800. Every town is going to have a first settlers list. Oh my gosh, really? Yes! I, there will be a first settlers list for every town. It, it's, it's just wonderfully wonderful. Uh, probate records, town records, the settlers of uh, births, baptisms, marriages and deaths, church records, uh, uh, various memoranda, uh, memos uh, related to the town and so on. There's all kinds of stuff in these town records and you just go pick one. So we, we picked on town guides uh, and uh, let's just use Connecticut as an example. Somebody here is from Connecticut. You're from Connecticut, okay. So we go to Connecticut uh, and it, uh, it will tell you a little bit about uh, how to use the stuff that you're going to use. And of course, the FamilySearch wiki uh, if you go to the, the wiki on Family Search in the, in the search tab, drop down menu, go to wiki, which I hope you're all doing because I work for them now. I want you all to go to the wiki. Um, so if you go and put in a location such as Connecticut or a particular uh, county in Connecticut, uh, it will return articles on that particular location what records are available for what year range. Uh, it'll give you the URL to go directly to that and so on, uh, it's, it's wonderful. But here we are in American Ancestors uh, and it tells you, you know, where to go to look for things. Uh, and uh, here are some record types for Connecticut towns. So here are uh, vital records. Here are deaths and burials from 1775 to 1808. Uh, here are records of a particular court of the colony from 1687 uh, to 1688. 
Uh, here's a list of first settlers. Here are marriages from 1684 to 1784. Did you know you could get this sort of thing? You stopped at 1850. There's stuff on the other side of that mountain. Just keep going. Um, here, there, there's so much stuff. Here's vital records, births, marriages, and deaths from 1665 to 1886. Just go there. American Ancestors has all this stuff. Go to the town records and you'll find this amazing amount of information. Here, here are vital records in Boston from 1704 to 1859 and so on. It's there. Um, here's, a, here's an example of a probate record uh, from Fairfield County, Connecticut. I don't know if any of you are Fair, Fairfield folk, uh, but uh, you go look up George Abbott, uh, and uh, he's, he's born uh, in 1731, uh, and this is, this is a probate record, uh, and uh, George Abbott, late of Norwalk, uh, he's born September 7, 1731. Benjamin, a son of George, uh, made choice of his brother Samuel Abbott of Norwich to be his guardian. And his widow, George's widow, Hannah Abbott, was appointed guardian of uh, uh, the other children who are named. 1731. Oh my. Online. Go there. It's great. Okay, here's the first book of records for Norwich. Um, uh, just uh, here's an example. The marriage of Samuel Pratt with Ruth, his wife, was upon the 25th of May in the year of our Lord, 1681. Ruth Pratt was the wife of Samuel Pratt and the daughter of Christopher Huntington Sr. of Norwich. And Ruth, his wife, deceased on February 14th, 1683. It's all right there. Oh my gosh. Look what's in there. Just go get it. <laughs> yes. What if you following a puzzle of Pennsylvania? Uh, you run out of right? Uh, you run out, did, did you go to American Ancestors and look in this? Did you go to American Ancestors? Oh. Go oh, look. <laughs> there, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, 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 is this under family search? No, AmericanAncestors.org. This is all on AmericanAncestors.org. Okay? Now, there are other places to look. Uh, I, I know many of you use Ancestry.com. If you're going to Ancestry, uh, may I encourage you to go to their card catalog in order to get to this stuff. And in the card catalog, um, it, you're, you're going to, uh, I, I put in colonial as a keyword uh, to get to colonial records. And then you can filter by, uh, you know, census and voter lists, uh, birth, marriage, and death, military, and so on. You can filter by what you want over here. Uh, and uh, here, here's an example. Here's Virginia colonial abstracts. Uh, so you can go and get some things. It's more spotty. Truly the best place to go is American Ancestors, but Ancestry does have some of this, uh, and Family Search does have some of this, uh, mostly uh, on their microfilm collections, and you, you all know the microfilm is going away, right? Okay, uh, no more microfilm in Family History Centers. You all know about that, right? Don't panic, we'll talk later, it's okay. The things that they're stopping, they're not sending out anymore. Most of the collection has been digitized and it's online for free, so they're not sending those out anymore. It's just not gonna circulate. They're not destroying them. They're all gonna be in the Granite Mountain Record Vault, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, hurrying on, there was a hand. What is that Millennium File thing up there? Every time I see that on Ancestry, you can't access it. Where, where are you looking? Very top. Very top. Oh, uh, they, um, early on, uh, they had uh, a bunch of uh, family trees, you know, the people had, uh, had put in, but they're private. Uh, so, yeah, so mostly you don't get in there. Okay, 
Um, here's an example from uh, the Virginia Colonial Abstracts. Uh, I just clicked on uh, Northumberland uh, County births, 1661 to 1810. Um, uh, Sarah Allen, daughter to John Allen, was born July, whatever year this book is in. Uh, so it, it gives you a lot of detail. You get the women too. Who would have guessed? Uh, there's a lot of great stuff in here. Now, uh, Tory's New England Marriages to 1700 is the, absolutely the uh, definitive work uh, on New England marriages. Uh, Tory was uh, a genealogist who spent his life uh, searching every genealogy of New England families that had been published prior to the 1950s, looking for marriages that took place mm -hmm. before 1700. Uh, and uh, he has more than 75,000 of these uh, uh, in his database, which they think is uh, more than 95% of the marriages that took place in that first century. Uh, it includes almost every couple from more than 2,000 published uh, genealogies. So New England Marriages to 1700 uh, by Clarence Torrey is the definitive work on marriages. Uh, you, you, uh, say again. New England. Uh, yes, yes. But there wasn't much more than New England uh, at that point. Uh, it was, it was uh, whatever the year was, uh, like 1815, 1820, uh, when, uh, when we had our first settlers going into Georgia. You know, it was a long, long time before we had a significant population anywhere but along the coast. Uh, so people started moving south and they started moving west, but the vast majority of the populace is going to be up in New England during that time frame. Yes, ma'am? Is that guide online or is it? Uh, I believe it is. I believe I have seen it online. Uh, and if you don't see it uh, in Ancestry, you can always go to, um, you know, ar archives.org. Uh, you, can, you can Google book it. Uh, you know, it'll, it'll show up. Just put it in your, your Google search engine. Yes? Yeah. So, but it, the, the records resonate almost with that same kind of structure. Mm -hmm. Would they have been re would missionaries have been required to sign some kind of agreement or contract? Oh yes, they they would have been uh, you know core people, and, and you know they're very important. So yeah, they they would they would be part of a contract. Okay. Uh, and and if you don't see them in a in a town contract, uh, then you want to go to the church records. Okay the missionary records and you know how the church expanded and where it went and how well the proselyting went and all that okay. is really detailed in, uh, in church histories. Okay. Uh, go to familysearch.org for the location, put in the location, uh, you know, in the card catalog, uh, put in the location, uh, and then as you, you know, go through the location results, go to church records and, and you'll find fascinating, uh, excellent stuff there. Okay, uh, you need to search by location for a lot of things, and I've already given you a heads up about those locations. It might be North Dakota, you know, so watch what you're doing. Um, I, this is in your handout of, of where to go, but let me, let me show you um, the county government websites are, uh, you know, great places to go. Censusfinder.com, censusfinder.com. Uh, will take you to county government websites and a number of other places. Uh, and it's very good at identifying uh, the links to early tax rolls and militia rolls. Uh, so I encourage you to go to Census Finder. Uh, US Gen Web uh, often has stuff from, uh, from the colonial era on the, on the counties. Uh, here's an example from censusfinder.com for Connecticut. I don't have anybody in Connecticut that I know of. I should have picked one of mine. But uh, anyway, here, here are uh, notes about what it's going to include and for what years and how many people are in it. Um, here's a, a 1790 to 1890 census records on Ancestry.com. It, you know, it's, it's sending you over there. It's a portal. Uh, here's 1636 to 1776 Colonial uh, Connecticut Records, right here. You click on that, it takes you over. Uh, so this is a wonderful portal for you. The, the actual data is not here, but it takes you to where you need to go. Uh, when we clicked on that uh, Colonial Connecticut Records, 
Uh, it gives you, you know, here's exact dates where you can go uh, read those same town records and whatnot that I was showing you earlier. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is stuff that was uh, stored not at the town level, but stored in university collections because they weren't functioning very well or they had personality conflicts with those that were there or whatever. And the, the records were donated to a university library. Uh, this is often done for those early years or copies and transcripts are often found in university libraries. I don't have time to go through it, but uh, the way that you find those are on NUCMUC, uh, N-U-C-M-C, National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections. You can just Google NUCMUC uh, and uh, that will help you find uh, collections that are at universities, N-U-C-M-C. National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections. Uh, when you get into those, here's a list of the freemen, those who were of age and who uh, had land, who were paying taxes. And you can, you can narrow down somebody's birth date because they appeared one, one year and they weren't there the, the year before, uh, but they were in the town, so they came of age. And in that location, they had to be 18 to come in age, of age, or they had to be 16 to come of age, and it will say. Uh, so you can get pretty close uh, on a lot of things that way, making uh, use of freemen uh, lists. You can also Google names uh, for uh, way back then. Um, I, I Googled uh, Johannes Ackermann, um, and he is found in a, a, a listing of Hessian soldiers from the Revolutionary War who settled in America. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of detailed information on those Hessian soldiers who opted to stay uh, after the crossing of the river. The I just, I, I went to Google you know, I in this. way down to find something like this. Uh, actually, I put in Johannes Ackerman and it was one of the first entries. Oh, we Yeah, so, you know, just it, see what you get off Google. There's a lot on Google that you can access directly that's uh, this more uh, archaic kind of uh, arcane stuff. Uh, if you're using legacy uh, as your home uh, pedigree software, um, uh, you should uh, be reminded of the research guidance feature that's in uh, legacy. You click on, uh, on that, whoever you're, uh, I'm on Isaac Stubbs, uh, whoever's highlighted, you click on research guidance and it will analyze uh, what you already have and what you might be missing. Uh, and it returns to you a list of all the sources that are available for that time and location, where to get them. It gives you the URLs or it gives you the physical address and phone number. It gives you call numbers of things, of books that you might want to use. And it's all built in. It's part of uh, the legacy uh, uh, software if you're using that as opposed to Roots Magic or Family Tree Maker or whatever. Um, uh, legacy is my own personal preference and uh, if you don't know, Legacy has just uh, been acquired by MyHeritage. So it will, uh, Legacy will show you um, in your home uh, file that's on your computer, uh, it will show you uh, the, the new information that's come out on MyHeritage. Uh, for your person. Uh, so that's uh, a nice thing. Um, a research guidance will give you lots of stuff on uh, local histories. This is a really good place to find it fast. Uh, and it will give you a description of what's in the book uh, and its limitations. Uh, a wonderful place for you to get information on your ancestors is by looking for military records. Uh, during the, the pre-1850 era. We had the American Revolution, we had the War of 1812, we had innumerable Indian Wars, uh, and there are military records. Uh, on the Family Search Wiki, uh, you can find this uh, military records selection table, uh, which shows uh, you know, what you look for in a military record in order to get age, birth date, birthplace, uh, children, death date, and so on, spouse, and so on. Uh, it'll show you exactly where to go to, to get that in a, in a military record. Uh, and you'll also find that there's a lot of information uh, that's been developed by descendancy associations such as the DAR, 
uh, daughters of the American Revolution or sons of the American Revolution, if you're a direct descendant of somebody uh, who was in the American Revolution or who participated in a material way. Uh, here's an example uh, of an application uh, and you have to put in uh, excellent uh, documentation to prove those relationships back. And this one says, I, Gilbert Andrew Clark, uh, a linear descendant of the name born in this place on this date. I was born on place and date. I am the son of, father and mother's names, uh, grandson of names, uh, great grandson of, great great grandson of, and so on. My ancestor participated uh, in establishing American independence while serving in the capacity of, so it might be somebody who carried freight. It might have been somebody who loaned money to the, uh, the Congress. Uh, it might have been a soldier. Um, here's one that says Robert Fisher's ancestor, David Jameson, uh, writes in over here. He says he contributed money and supplies to the Continental Army and to the Continental Congress while in session at York, 1777 to 78. He was also a colonel of the 2nd Battalion New York Militia. He was also captain, brigade uh, major, and lieutenant colonel of uh, provincial forces in Pennsylvania in the French and Indian War, etc. Uh, so you get a lot of detail and it's stuff that has been very well documented. You can go to these descendancy organizations and request those uh, records. Uh, the DAR charges uh, $10 uh, for um, a copy of a proven application. You can go through the index uh, to find names uh, and then uh, pay $10 to get all their, their documentation. Well, you know, hey, that's 10 bucks well spent <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Uh, these I couldn't resist showing you. Um, these are glass plate photos of the last living uh, uh, survivors from the American Revolution. They lived long enough to get into the era for photography. Uh, and uh, they, they were 100 years old, essentially, uh, when the, the pictures were taken. And then later, another man uh, was able to find another eight but these are photographs of people who were in the American Revolution. Do you believe what is available to you? I'm going to dash on because we have like a second before. <laughs> no, I can't stop. OK, Fold 3 uh, is a subscription website that's available to you um, at, at uh, family history centers to use for free. Uh, the War of 1812 has incredible information available to you. Uh, and you just, you, you choose, here's War of 1812, I want, I want the pension files, which are gold mines. Of course, military records is another thing. Uh, and uh, you, you pick uh, the state and the name uh, of the person uh, by alphabet. So uh, I'm going to look for uh, Briggs Alden. Uh, and uh, it gives you soldier surnames and you just go down until you, you find Alden and, and uh, uh, click on that. Uh, here's Briggs Alden and here are uh, various pages of what's available in a digital image for him from the War of 1812 and here we get to his pension file. The cards are gold. You want the pension file card. Uh, there are other great things but you really want the pension file card. Uh, so here's an example of what's on uh, uh, Briggs Alden. It shows down here. It shows you know his his vital statistics and whatnot up here. But down here it shows the residence of the soldier, the residence of his widow after he died, the maiden name of three wives that he had over his lifespan, first, second, and third wife named as such the marriage date and place, the death date of the soldier, and then finally when the widow who was receiving the widow's pension died, her death date is listed there, all on this little card. This is War of 1812, on the other side of that 1850 mountain. And up here under Bounty Land, I don't have time to tell you all this stuff, but this little number right here, will take you to the BLM website where you can go find out where he got, his, where he chose his bounty land to be. 
Um, in, in the wiki, go find all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, and uh, you can Google your ancestor's location. Uh, my, uh, my Isaac uh, uh, Stout was um, uh, in Preble County, Ohio. So I, I just put in where he lived. Uh, and it came back with county records, which gives me uh, birth, cemetery, censuses, church, death, all kinds of wonderful things. So just Google the name, Google the location. Court records, we've talked a little bit about the quarter sessions, you know, where they met every three months. Uh, and this is where you're going to find probate, wills, uh, land records, all civil matters, you know, who hated whom and, you know, complaints about the barking dog and your cows got in my field, uh, et cetera. Uh, that's all here in these uh, court records. Uh, the court records will have the deeds. Now here, you know, when you've got a, uh, your house, your deed is where? County Recorder, gosh, Rudy's. It's at the County Recorder uh, back then too. Uh, so in the court, uh, you'll get deeds, probate, apprenticeships, uh, all these orphans and whatnot. Uh, a lot of them were uh, apprenticed out. There was an orphans court uh, that established where uh, you know who's going to take care of them and what responsibilities do they have. Uh, for taking care of them, how much do they have to provide, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, I, I must tell you about indentured servants before we go. Beth, forgive me. Um, indentured servants during this time frame constituted a huge proportion of the incoming migration. Now in the early 1600s, it's mostly the company uh, notion. But particularly uh, as people moved south, uh, the, the people who were coming over from Europe couldn't afford to get here. So they made an arrangement whereby someone else would pay their passage to get here in exchange for a period of time that they would work for the person who paid. Sometimes they would uh, come over and the captain would take the risk uh, and when they got here, they were kind of on an auction block just like the slaves and immediately next door, uh, they would say, you know, who wants this one uh, to take them on as an indentured servant, generally for seven years. The records of this are kept at the court uh, and we have as many as 80% of those who came in the 1700s came on indentures. So you're going to find the records of 80% of the populace in indentured servants database. Here is the indentured servants database, uh, which is a private website, but it's uh, made available to you uh, for free, bless their hearts. Uh, you put in the, the name of the, the person and any additional information that you have. It has all kinds of things, like if they're if they're a, an orphan or they first born or third born or whatever, when they, you know, were they left from when they got here? What ship did they come on? Were they convicts? Uh, a, a lot of convicts were ship, shipped over and uh, put on indentures. Uh, how long was it? Uh, the year of their freedom, uh, you know, who's managing it? Who was the master and where were they going to live? Uh, so many things, could they read or not? Did they get married? You weren't allowed to get married when you, when you were um, uh, still in your indentures because it would take away from your uh, service to the master. Uh, but a lot of them did. Whether they got head rights, which of course was the, the, the way so many had come in and so on. Uh, here's uh, Archibald Robinson, uh, who came into Virginia in 1684. Uh, his date of uh, servitude ended in uh, 1698. You can click on view and it will show you a digital image uh, or transcript depending on what's available for that particular one. But 80% of the 1700s in the immigrant servants database, you can Google it as immigrant servants database or indentured servants database and it will, it will bring it up for you. Uh, just Google it. Uh, it, it's fabulous uh, and it, it just it tells you so much and it gives you the source of where you can go for additional information on that. It often includes other members of the family who were taken in by the same people. 
There are uh, voting lists, uh, poll books, uh, you know, who got, uh, who got taxed. Uh, the county recorder has all the land deeds, the tax records, and so on. Uh, and uh, there are lots of wonderful maps. Uh, tax maps showed the name of the person who lived in each place so the tax collector could go and, and be sure that they got it. You can go for local histories and biographies to uh, Google Books. Um, one of mine, um, we knew that we had several people in the family, uh, I, I have a long line of Quakers, uh, and we knew that several of them uh, were conductors on the Underground Railroad. And just by going to Google uh, Books, uh, I was able to find a description uh, at West Elkton. Uh, one of the fearless conductors was Thomas Stubbs, uh, nicknamed Mill Tom Stubbs to distinguish him. He was a man of medium height, light build, but wiry, strong, quick, absolutely fearless, very reticent. And it gives a couple of incidents that are recorded in this history. This is all pre-1850s. Despair not. Go not away. <laughs> Go over the mountain and find yours. Love you lots. Thanks for having me.